the Choices Global, a production of First Assembly of God, Wertmanville, Georgetown, Guyana. As we cultivate conversations pertinent to nation building, we have gathered a group of panelists, all Guyanese, to discuss agriculture and Guyana's opportunity to become the breadbasket of the Caribbean. Our panel includes Aubrey Sultan, a university graduate in agriculture science and a large scale farm manager. Marion Stewart is an expert in agro-processing and works at the Guyana School of Agriculture. Julius David is a university graduate in agriculture science and operates in the education sector. Limar Williams is one of our youth panelists, a UB law graduate and a Caribbean man at heart. Kurt Corbin is a security project management and administration professional residing in Geneva, Switzerland. And yours truly, Chevron Corbin, I will be your moderator for this segment. As we welcome the panelists, panelists, welcome. You know, as we prepare to discuss agriculture, I believe the bread basket tag may seem a bit cliche, but in Europe, what we see is the impact of the Ukraine Russia conflict and what it is doing on the supermarket shelves in terms of the freshness of the produce and even the availability. I believe we need to signal to our viewers that we see the international community touting the next pandemic as hunger due to food insecurity. So today, let's have a chat. Let's look at the opportunities um, for Guyana. And um, I'll pose the first question to you, Aubrey, and panelists, you can lean in as Aubrey um, takes us through this first question. Let's talk together about the big opportunities in agriculture for small and large scale farmers. Aubrey, what's your take? So, welcome again to Choices Global. And uh, I want to start off by explaining what happened over a two year span before I get directly into the question. So, in the beginning of 2020, when the pandemic started, we in the Caribbean started to, to feel a squeeze when it comes to um, production and when it comes to food, food security, right? So that caused a minute problem at the beginning of the pandemic. And as the years progressed, the two years that the pandemic happened, it started to increase. So just as it started to increase, we were hit with another situation with the war in Europe. So that caused things to be very, um, very unhealthy for the Caribbean in terms of food security. And so coming out of those issues, we have big opportunities. And the one that I'd like to mention is the one, the initiative that the president, um, Dr. Irfan Ali started with the Agri Investment Expo. And that is birthed because of the fact that these issues are being faced with all of the Caribbean countries. And so to, um, to go against that, this is how uh, the initiative was birthed. And just a part of the initiative, it's to increase and to start production where we haven't in plants and livestock. And I'll leave it there so that the other panelists could bounce off of some of the things that I've mentioned. Guyana stands to move in that direction. Um, where we've been saying it is years now we've been saying that Guyana has the potential to become the breadbasket of the Caribbean. What do we have? How is that possible? We have the lands that are necessary for cultivation. Um, agriculture, it, the, in, our, in order for agriculture to move forward, land must be available. We have all kinds of technologies, but land is so essential. And that is why we've seen um, that one of the memorandum being signed by, um, by Guyana and Barbados is to lease land to Barbados. Um, how many acres of land? Because why? Um, me and 
we may make a lot of noise over it, but Barbados seem to have the technology to cultivate these lands. We have the land, we don't have the technology, and in many instances, we might not have the willingness of people to go into, into that direction. And so if we're to move forward, then we have to put these things in place. And so we, um, we are partnering with, with Barbados in terms of um, the cultivations of these land. The second thing is there is a conversation that has started as well, um, where we have um, fertilizers and these different chemicals um, give license and set up, you know, the different uh, uh, framework for it to start manufacturing in Guyana. We spoke about um, the war in Ukraine and, and Russia, and we've seen how that has impacted not um, only directly, but indirectly. We need fertilizers for, for our crop production, but we don't produce it. And so we still rely on them for, for some major things because the lands that we're using, what we found is that after a period of time, it will become depleted. And so we have to have supplements so that we can continue agricultural production at a level so that we can meet our local needs and we can go um, be able to provide these, um, these produce uh, or products by products to our neighboring countries. So this is a step forward in becoming the breadbasket of the Caribbean. And if we look at it and we try to jump in as Guyanese, we try to see where we can um, where we can step in and, and contribute and to, um, to lend towards this whole movement of becoming the breadbasket of the Caribbean. Awesome. I think and um, what I heard you say, Julius, um, around having land and, and being mindful of, of need of fertilizer and other inputs. I want to double back um, before Kurt jumps in on a point Aubrey made. You know, when we enter 2020 and we saw food shortages, let me translate this into numbers for our viewers. We as a Caribbean are apparently importing about 80 plus percentage of our food. 80% of our food products, despite the land, despite um, our ability to, to produce in the Caribbean. And so as Aubrey referenced the Agri Forum that was held um, just in May in Guyana, um, I saw that one of the things that the Caribbean nations or CARICOM nations were targeting is a reduction in our import by 25%. So Guyanese, as we talk about agriculture, this is what is before us an issue but an opportunity to reduce that 83 percent food bill to something that we as the caribbean and we as guyanese benefit from as we produce food not only for ourselves but for our neighbors kurt your reflections thank you siobhan um i'm i i listened to the previous speakers and, and yourself and um i i am in total agreement with what they what they have said uh, I was doing some research as well about agriculture in Guyana and uh, index index Mundi, I think index Mundi.com, they were the on the website it indicated that Guyana uses 8.4 percent of land of land mass in agriculture in total agricultural production and 8.4 percent is is not a significant amount um, based on our land mass. So for me, an opportunity, someone mentioned opportunity before. For me, an opportunity is there for us to diversify and for us to increase. Um, what I would like to see more of, taking into consideration all that was discussed previously, and especially this, this new conflict or new war in, in Ukraine and Russia, I would like to see us diversify more. Um, currently, there's an indication that grain and wheat will 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 become scarce on the market because of because of the effect of that conflict so for us as Guyanese how can we diversify what else can we produce in, in 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 as a substitute for not just for us to utilize but for us to export to the Caribbean and this is this is an opportunity that we can seize not just for now but for the future and we should also be forward thinking and anticipating what more, suppose there's another war with another country, another conflict in another area. 
you know what this is where our our i would like us to see our authorities really come in, uh creating think tanks maybe and uh focus groups maybe and beginning to really think about agriculture and where do we want to go how what do we want to do how can we encourage more farmers how can we encourage more citizens to come on board to get on board with this plan agriculture has money not just in crops but in livestock as well i think we need to we need to make that point it encompasses crops and uh, livestock and as we focus on our home first first we need to ensure we have a supply for for our nation guyana and then we can think about increasing to the caribbean and maybe even further afield and as you said moderator we, there's an opportunity here for Ghana to earn I think currently agriculture brings in 16.8% on average, 17% average approximately contribute to the GDP. That's a significant amount. However, we can, why not go to 25%? Why not go to 30% as a contribution contributor to the GDP? So this is where we'd like to see us going, creating focus groups, creating think tanks, trying to anticipate the next conflict, where it will be, what it, what will, what, what it will affect. And going from there and just developing our plan rather than reacting, we can be more proactive, Madam Moderator. Kurt, you mentioned um, opportunities and, you know, what we can do. And immediately, institutions came to mind. Institutions in Guyana, such as banks. Um, we're talking about the effects that the Ukraine-Russia war has on our nation and in the Caribbean as a whole. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, that bank in its business loan programs, um, it offers agricultural loans, such as loans for poultry farming and other things. So maybe if other banks and other lending institutions follow the pattern, you know, to, to at least help our farmers, those, those young ones that are now starting, to, to, to let them know that although there may be a world economic recession or inflation in certain parts of the world you know we we see the value and the importance of agriculture and so we are willing to not only give you loans but but brace you during this period and i think that may be an opportunity because you you will let our our people know that yes our lending and, and, and institutions are, are behind us and they're backing us, then we can go into this direction and help Guyana truly become the breadbasket of the Caribbean. So I, I was just thinking about that. Limar, I'm happy you mentioned funding because I believe any industry that we're talking about, we will need funding to get things moving or to, to accelerate what we're doing. And so in addition to you referencing the agricultural loans of banks, I was reflecting on the context of Switzerland where we are residing and the fact that um, Switzerland's agriculture industry thrives because there are a lot of subsidies. And so again, I'm just framing this as an opportunity where when we receive um, revenues from oil, and I know we are hoping oil will do so many things, but um, even in our national budgets, that as we try to push the agriculture sector at a national level, there's an opportunity to look at, um, at subsidies. Now, if we speak to our large and small scale farmers, how do we see the need? What are the needs or the ideas around technology around soil management and so on and so forth that small or large scale or medium scale farmers should be considering? In terms of um, having better equipment and higher forms of technology, now we are heading in the direction of a more uh, climate smart agriculture. They wow. are heading in the direction where we are now trying to adapt because different places have varying temperature where crops are grown and all of those things. These climate smart agricultural practices are now there to, um, to adapt to those conditions that are present within those specific countries. And for the Caribbean, it's, our problem here is a lot of heat. So that is what climate smart agriculture is trying to adapt to 
in this part of the world. And I remember at the Agri Investment Forum, um, I was asking about how do you go on a on an extremely large scale when it comes to um, poultry production? Because since the um, war as well, we have experienced a very huge shortage in chicken in the in the country. So I was trying to get an idea as to if this would be a a good opportunity for us to venture out into something bigger and more larger and yes that the answer is yes you are able to venture out into that area where you could produce um, a larger quantity of poultry they told me that it takes 50 million dollars to have the startup that they have and they mine a couple well thousands of birds so and it's all enclosed they don't they don't take up a lot of land space even though there is a lot of land space in Ghana uh, to use and everything is enclosed and it is done with technology feeding is done automatic watering automatic and all of these things automatic because we're going into a place where higher technology is being involved in production and just a side a side one we're heading into um forestry is also a big part of agriculture as well as fisheries um and aquaculture so yeah awesome technology any other reactions julius Kurt, I, was just, I was just about to jump in uh Siobhan, thank you um agriculture as well uh, it has a significant, as, as I'm going to talk about the labor force before, as, I, as I go to technology. Agriculture as well has a significant, um, has a significant amount of employees, or should I say the sector employs a significant amount of Guyanese. It's about 17% of the entire uh, national labor force. Uh, they are employed in agriculture. Now, this is a significant amount of, of, of people. However, Guyana, as we know, we do not have one million persons. So for us to really expand and for us to really maximize agricultural production, we really would have to move towards technology. We, as we increase and as we should increase to, to maximize our potential, the labor force would not be enough. Currently, it's at 17% of the, of the national labor force. So for us to really... Um, to diversify for us to go into agro agro processing. We we would need to employ these various types of technologies that Aubrey and Miriam mentioned earlier. And um, to really be efficient, to go to medium scale to large scale, we cannot employ 50 persons and, and for us to for for it to be efficient. Guyana is known as a popular destination for agriculture because the the labor the labor is it's 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 um what should I say? It's on the inexpensive side. However, for us to really become and maintain, becoming at the breadbasket of, of the Caribbean is one thing. We, now we have to, to maintain that is something totally different. First, we, we, we first need to understand what we need to produce for Guyanese. So that's 750 something thousand that we speak about consistently among the persons living in the country. We need to figure out exactly what we need to feed those persons. Whether it be in fishery, whether it be in crops, whether it be in livestock, we need to we need to figure out what is required for, to feed our population and maintain that. And when we've achieved that comfortably, then we can begin to look at exporting to the Caribbean and the, and the world at large. And with that, that that comes at a, at a regular cycle. We need to provide at a regular cycle. So we'll have to have the equipment that I think the large scale uh, combines the large scale. The, 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 the arable fields where we can rotate crop, that we can have crop rotation and not be replanting and replanting on the same land over and over. Of course, we will use, lose the fertility and the crops will, the crop standard or quality will diminish. So these are things that, that I would like to see us be deliberate and acting, and acting on, opening new farmlands in the interior, opening new farmlands in different high, in different areas, producing different crops because we know our main exports are rice and sugar, and sugar has been around for over 300 years. 
So we really need to diversify. Why can't we not produce large uh, on a larger scale more old crows? How much? Uh, why can we not produce uh, produce for our our nation and then export various crops? So Lange, why not? Or Bora, or even add new things. I think Aubrey can speak more to superfoods, the foods like kale and so forth. Those are foods that has great nutritional value. Why can we not focus on those and 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 gain money on them? The the superfoods we can charge more for them. We have the land. We, our land is suitable and fertile and and really uh what should I say compatible for that type for the, those types of food. So I would really like to see us go in that direction, Siobhan. One of the things that I want to add, I love that you've mentioned um the the importance of, of moving and, and utilizing technology but i want to talk on a tangential point that is um infrastructure i noticed that we're going in the right direction in developing our roadways and and, and those important that is an important part of, of of really and truly tapping into our agricultural potential because we can boast about the farmlands and, and everything, but how do we access it? How do we get to it? And so moving in, in, in developing roads. So I, I was I was thinking and I was talking with a friend, you know, we have trips at our youth group, Nali Secundus, and we go into all of these areas, the hinterland areas and what's not. But it usually takes a long period of time. You know, we look at, I'm sure Siobhan and Kurt can speak about Switzerland and how it is quite easy for you to get to point A from point B or to point B from point A, just a matter of a couple minutes sometimes. You know, whereas in Guyana, um, to go from region four to region one, it would take two days, three days, you know? So developing and, and, and much more emphasis on, on our infrastructure and our, our roadways is, is a step in the right direction because we can have the technology in, let's say, in, in, in Georgetown, but we need to get it to the place where, where the lands and, and the farmers can utilize it and, and really and truly they can yield, you know, higher harvest and, and, and other things. So having roads, good roads and, and, and better infrastructure is, is a uh, emphasis should be placed on that. While I agree with um, the old notion of technology and as Limar would have rightly stated, um, the need for robust infrastructural work, I think that one of the major things that we have, I mean, overlooked is policies, government policies geared towards towards agriculture we've spent we what we have would have been policies that would have been set a whole how many years ago and would have been focusing primarily on our traditional crops which we are we are begging to move in the direction of diversifying but we need um policy changes we need better policies that will guide our agricultural production what you what we're seeing happening is that some of our prime agricultural land is actually being given out for house lots and so if we have proper framework then we will recognize that the prime agricultural land needs to be given for agricultural production and that will encourage more persons because take for example you give a guy um 20 acres of land in the in the sandy area now you now have to battle what is the best suited crop um i can grow there and then you now have to carve out your market for that crop because more than likely it's something that is not readily um demanded on the market and um so we need that that policy framework um i was only friday in barbies and in glasgow and there is this guy, this guy was featured for so many um, months or probably years um, with his efforts with grape production and uh, um, these other exotic crops you have like um, strawberry and apples and so on. 
these are the things that have been said that cannot be grown in Guyana. But we have seen this the effort by this guy, and he has proven our theory we had as incorrect because it's been grown. Maybe he has a, a private, um, a, a secret recipe that he's using. But if we have proper framework in place for massive research, for massive studies, right, so that we can develop um, these new crops that are coming in. And um, uh, if we have that framework, I think that agriculture can, because one of the critical elements in agricultural production requires research continuous research and it requires proper policy framework so that we can guide and we can um, be better able to move in the direction that we want to go. Powerful, um, Julius, and maybe I'll allow Aubrey and the others to react, but what I'm hearing here is when you look at agriculture from a national landscape, there are several things that need to converge and policy is where where it comes all together. I heard Limar talk about um, transportation network. I wanted to talk about that and the supply chain. You need to talk about storage, you know, as you move it from the farm to the, the to the point of export, how do you keep, keep it fresh? Uh, we need to talk about, as Julius, you spoke about research. We want to offer our our viewers and our citizens different options for farming. So this gentleman that has been growing grapes in Guyana, uh, maybe he wants to have a niche marketing in, in exotic fruits. Um, there is the option to have bio, you know, bio products in, in Switzerland um, go at almost double the price of, um, of products um, produced with fertilizers. Um, so those are some of the things I'm listing. Kurt, you mentioned labor, and I believe that um, Julius being in the education sector, I'd be curious to hear what programs we have to encourage persons to deliberately choose agriculture as an area of study, um, rather than some of the stories we heard even from our own panelists who, who kind of ended up in agriculture um, by some other circumstances, but now they love it. So how do we transfer your love, Julius, your love, Aubrey, of agriculture, uh, Marianne, to others? Um, and Kurt, when you mentioned labor and the need for technology, uh, one of the things that I reflected on is that Guyana needs to have a mindset that at some point, even when technology helps us to scale up, we will also need to contemplate importing labor. You know, uh, living here in Geneva, Switzerland, we see uh, what we call the frontalier, where the Swiss um, economic system depends on the Italians and the French crossing the border. I remember my grandfather um, traveling from Guyana to Guadeloupe um, as a parboiler, as they call it, or pan boiler in the sugar industry. So Guyana also needs to be open and prepared that we might have to import seasonal workers. Um, we see this um, with the Mexicans crossing the border um, to the U.S. Um, um, you know, on a seasonal basis. So those are just some of the things I wanted um, to throw out there in terms of policy. But I don't know reactions from you are rebuilding on what Julius has um, posited to us. Yes, of course. And in terms of, I'll, I'll start with the end and then go up. In terms of um, having things there encouraging people to enter into the field of agriculture because um, now we are getting into a very diverse form of practicing agriculture. There, there are now things like drones that as soon as, you know, children see they're interested in and drones can be used to fertilize um, crops. Drones can be used to do a lot of things. So persons are now interested in those types of um, forms of practicing agriculture. There's also the use of, um, what is the program? It uses the satellite to map out the layout of the soil and to give you an average as to how much acres you're working with and all that. When it comes to me, I'll mention it. And you also spoke about, so those are some things that are there to encourage persons who are younger, who are more immature towards going into agriculture. And those are some uh, 
minor things that can encourage them into the field. Um, what I wanted to touch on is that you spoke about transportation and transporting goods and so on to um, produce, to and fro. So in Perico, I believe Perico produces yeah. around 60% of the entire country's produce, right? But even though Perico produces that amount of produce for tongue, a lot of that produce is lost because of the fact that it cannot transport everything that they have made straight out of tongue. And so a large percentage of it goes to wastage. And something that I would have been discussing with some of my colleagues is that we first need to monitor a few small problems that we have in terms of ensuring that we could deliver all of the produce that we have so that when we are now tackling other issues like um, exporting and importing, we are making full use of what we already have. And that comes back to Lee Mars point where we have to produce um, proper access roads to these places, proper facilities whereby it could be stored and transported to and fro so that we'd minimize the waste and we'd maximize the usage of the goods that we actually produce. Um, back over to you. Well, I think we're out of time, so I'm going to give two persons 15 seconds. What is the game changer for agriculture in Guyana? For me, um, one of the important um, policy tools that acts as a game changer is the new program the Guyana National Bureau of Standards has implemented, Made in Guyana. Our identity is important. If we are to become the breadbasket of the group, present ourselves as the breadbasket. So Made in Guyana is an excellent initiative to show that Guyanese products are world-class. And so that is something we can tap into and continue to make Guyana great and the breadbasket of the Caribbean. If I may quickly add, when we think about agriculture, we normally only focus on the fresh produce and fresh meat. But it's important if we be become the breadbasket of the Caribbean, then this is where value added products comes in. So rather than consuming everything fresh, then we can have the opportunity now of um, improving on our value added products and having much more widespread use of things when they're not out, when they're out of season. So instead of consuming everything fresh, and then uh, we mentioned earlier about the spoilage, then this is where the post harvest techniques comes in in terms of proper transportation with the right temperature and storage, in terms of not, not in the hot sun like we do in Guyana here most times, but having the correct transportation unit. So transport the unit, the, the produce at the right temperature and keeps fresh while it gets to the receiver of it. So value added. In terms of also ensure that you have the product, the produce to consume when it's out of season. So with that being said, thank you for listening and being a part of, a part of the panel tonight. Awesome, Marianne. We couldn't have had a better close. And um, I want to thank our panelists and I want to thank our viewers for remaining um, with us. I think what we heard today was we went through the inputs needed. We talked about having land and having labor and needing technology. I think we talked about the enablers. We need policy. We need policy on stockpiling. We need policy on value add, as Maria is, uh, Marianne is just saying. Um, I referenced subsidies to ensure that our agriculture um, product will survive. And um, I think the outcome, the outcome for me, back to Vision 25 by 2025, I think it was a powerful um, team uh, at the Agri um, Investment um, Expo, because as Guyanese, as the Caribbean, we need to acknowledge or keep at our focus that we need to reduce that 83% import bill and if we can reduce it by 25% by 2025, we would have been helping ourselves and our Caribbean brothers to 
uh, becoming the breadbasket and, be, and, and achieving food security is what I wanted to see. So our time is gone. Viewers, we want to thank you for staying and being faithful. Please keep in touch with us at faogw.org and our YouTube channel, Choices Global. Join us again on 17th of July for another episode. I am Chevron Corbin, your moderator for today, and I really want to thank our panelists for an engaging session. Remain safe. This is Choices Global.